Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for those billows of your love and your peace. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've provided in that place. To solidify that place, that strong place of peace. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Candy and I want to give praise, testimony to the glory of God for keeping our family. Yesterday, I didn't know, but Watson, when he was leaving the house, he texted Davy back in a little bit and said, Davy, just make sure that you, the kids are buckled in real good today. He said, I had a dream that you were in a, a car wreck. And then we knew, Candy and I knew when we were headed over to uh, Amber's, one of Amber's had, uh, her daughters had a Christmas program last night, so we were headed over there, but I, was, I knew that Davy and her little ones were going to a, a parade in which Drea, the middle one, was going to participate in. It was downtown Naples. So when I was coming out, I was going through the garage, and then I, I listened. I tried to listen to those times, but, and I didn't know anything about Watson's dream, but I said, in the name of Jesus, I just released the angels of the Lord over that those children, the, the angel of the Lord encamps around about them and delivers them. And I release that and I speak that. So she called us. We didn't, we started, you know, we were headed towards going where we were going and we're halfway to LaBelle, someplace. We got the call and uh, she's crying. She's crying. She's upset. She was just in a... Uh, pretty serious car wreck and it hit the side where the baby was at and uh, so we're praying for her and and she can't get in touch with Watson but so then the good thing she said well I know one thing you know I, I know this I'm not at fault the way this thing happened so I'm not at fault she felt good about that but it just was an attack complete attack because before it was all over with, she called us back and she's still distraught. We had to stop at the Walmart and LaBelle and so I'm talking to her. So uh, unbelievably, even with, the, even with the other car leaving the scene of the accident and they had to find him over in another place, even with that, they didn't charge him. They charged Davy with the accident. It was just a total, I don't, you know, I don't see how when a person leaves the scene of an accident, and uh, so she felt the attack of that. So she was very distraught and with other challenges that come about uh, with these kind of things. So, but here's the thing. Somebody said, well, why didn't, why didn't God stop the, what did Satan have planned? Kill him. Just kill him. We got all three of our grandkids and our daughter tonight. Hallelujah. A, a car can be replaced. Can be replaced. So you're going, to go through, you're going to go through scrapes. You're going to go through battles. Not, uh, you're not going to be unscathed in this life. You're going to, this, this is a real war. And, and uh, don't ever think uh, that he doesn't want to absolutely. His end, his end game is to kill, steal, and destroy. His end game is, is uh, he's not playing. We're not playing. He... He's found out that we're not playing around here. So, <laughs> uh, you're real safe. You're real safe if you go all the way in. Now, I've told people before that I thought they were playing around and, and messing around in other places. Uh, don't try this <laughs> if, you're not all, if you're not serious. Okay? But we're, we're real safe because we're all going in. Amen. Hallelujah. So, Father, I want to thank you that not only for my little ones, but all of everybody that's on this journey doesn't, doesn't mean that we're perfected, doesn't mean that we don't have faults that are changing from glory to glory in your presence. But, Lord, we are uh, very intent on where we're going. And so, Father, we know that the wicked one, he, he can only do so much as in presenting a, a fight.
But Lord, to be able to carry out his plans, we stand. We stand in all of you. We thank you for your peace. Hallelujah. We're revisiting the churches of Revelation tonight. This is, uh, <laughs> Candy said it was the 10th lesson. I can't believe it. The, the Ephesian Revival Part 2. Now this is in particularly kind of funny because we're not even going to go to the book of Revelation tonight. We won't even go there. Uh, we're actually going to go to the book of Acts in a little bit. But let me review just a little bit before we do that. We've got a nice little, although it's kind of sad, film uh, on uh, it's still by the day of discovery. It's a, about five or six minutes long. We'll watch it in just a minute. Let me review something on, uh, and the reason why I incorporated Ephesians once again, even though we've covered Ephesians in Jesus' warning to the book of, in the book of Revelation to the church at Ephesus, is that we're catching through this an understanding of the church at Ephesus as in regards to uh, the revival. We're going back now to the book of Acts. We picked up on Ephesus in the, in the book of Revelation in the warning that Jesus gives them. And I'll just remind you that as we go through that, they were the first church in Asia that, that Jesus speaks to through John on the Isle of Patmos um, and gives them a warning. But the first part of their uh, dial, or the, the first part of what Jesus, um, uh, his, his criticism or his looking at them, they really were doing an awesome job, a really awesome job. It was only right at the end that he says, you've lost your first love, that he really has something against them. But uh, we found out from the book of Acts, which we'll go there in a little bit, um, that Ephesus had a strategic place in all of Asia, in all those seven churches. It was kind of like the uh, uh, core or the epicenter. And so let me just look. I, I won't spend much on last week because we really need to. Here's something that I really liked that we saw last week because in the preface of just reiterating again and again what we're called to do, I said this and I read this out of, you don't, Turn there, please. Uh, Acts chapter 1, uh, verse 1 and 2. Luke, the physician who wrote the book of Luke and who wrote Acts, um, he says this when he's writing to Theophilus, this person of nobility. He says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. The former treatise, he's talking about my former, my past tense writing that I wrote to you. If you go back to the book of Luke, you'll find out that he's writing to the same nobleman. He's, he's writing to the same guy. And I hope you're learning not only through doctrine, but through biblical study. So it gives you an overall more understanding of the, the scriptures, the chronology. Chronology is very important sometimes because sometimes the Holy Spirit will dove that, t dovetail that with doctrine. Like, oh, I get that. I know why he said that because I see how that all came about in the chronology of time. So when Luke says the former writing I've written to you, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus both. And here was what was key to me. It was simple, but it was very powerful. Both began or began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen so he said well, what I'm what I'm writing about is everything that Jesus did and everything that he taught and so that's what we want to be that's that's our goal we want to be conformed to his image and we not only want to be uh, be able to teach this, we want to be able to show it, show and tell. I mean, so the opposite, we want to tell it and show it. I mean, we want to absolutely demonstrate it as well. So I, I really don't know why, other than really wonderful programs and peace of knowing salvation. But it's hard, it, it, it's hard for me in that sense of the word of where the church has gone to, disintegrated to, to know why the world even wants us or wants Christianity. 
Because we sure can't, and I say in a general sense of the word, we sure can't demonstrate the power anymore. And there's no separation of, of uh, difference between righteousness in, in a general sense. In a general sense. I mean, overall, if you go to the general churches of America today, and if a person says, I'm a born-again Christian, I'm a born-again Christian, I sing in the choir, and um, I've been going here for five years, and uh, I fellowship with all the, the fellowship and, and, you know, the, the different things, and uh, I pay my tithes and all those kinds of things, you may find... Eight, I don't know how to say this, whether it's on the, you may find eight out of ten, or at least, that would, would fight you if you told them, if, if they said, yes, me and my boyfriend, or yes, me and my girlfriend, we occasionally have sex. If you told them, if you continue to do that, you're going to go to hell. You would have the biggest fight on your hands, even among preachers. Because they believe that they don't believe that. They believe that what you and I are commonly teaching on all those scriptures that say, if you continue in these things, you do not know him. And if you did know him, you are destroying the image of the candle that is on the inside of you. And eventually, and sooner, the, it'll, it'll, Real, real quick, the, further, the faster you go, the sooner that candle will be extinguished. <laughs> Based on everything I'm hearing from a lot of you at times about what you, the feedbacks of you get from other fellow Christians on Facebook, I, what we teach is just, it, it's, a, it's another, see, what I'm saying, what, going back to what I was originally saying, why, does, why would the world want Christianity today? It's mainly through programs. It's mainly through we got something really cool going on in our church because the draw of like, you're different and I want to be different. I want to come out of this. That's not there. And the power's not there. So, uh, but it's, that's going to change. That is absolutely going to change. Um. So our confession is this, we embrace the former treatise here, which is what? We want to do everything that he did and everything that he taught. Amen? Simple, that's simple, Simon. That's really pretty simple stuff. Um, let me give you some historical stuff, a reminder, before we get into this tonight, because I think it's um, important. That's historical information, and then we'll jump right into the second portion of this. Um, it's believed that John wrote the book of Revelation around on the Isle of Patmos around 95 A.D., which means that John was born right at the at the beginning of you know that first century. So he's a very old man. It's also believed that John died in Ephesus around 98 A.D. Okay, so. However old John was, he may have been born. He may have been born three BC. He may have been over a hundred. Okay, so Paul was executed historically by Nero around 65 AD. It's estimated that he was in his mid 60s. Why are you telling us this? Because again, we want to kind of get a focus on where we're going tonight on the book of Ephesians. Therefore, it could be understood that John's writings to the church of the book of Revelation, it came approximately 30 years after Paul's death, okay? It's also estimated that Paul left Timothy at Ephesus to be in charge of the church around 64 AD, and that's just a couple of years or a few years before he actually was uh, martyred by Nero in, that before Paul was martyred by Nero in Rome. It's estimated that Timothy was martyred in Ephesus around 97 AD, at around the age of 80 years old. This would have put Timothy somewhere in his 40s or 50s when Paul left him in charge. Uh, just a little bit more historical. It seems possible that both John and Timothy were still alive when the book of Revelation was first presented. We know that John, obviously, was alive because he received it, but when it was actually 
you know, presented to the church at Ephesus and all the churches in Asia Minor. Um, John was probably, when that was going out, and Timothy, they both probably were, st were still alive at the time. So, we're looking at revisiting the churches of Revelation. This is Ephesian Revival, part two. Um, let's watch, if we can, Harry. Thank you guys with the likes, the, this video. And uh, I'll be right back. I hope everybody at home can listen to this and hear it real well. This too is Ephesus. Just outside the gate leading to the Temple of Magnesia is the city dump, standing in sharp contrast to the bustling opulence and marble-clad glitter of the city of Ephesus is this quiet, very sad place. Sad because here, among these littered relics of the past, was the place where citizens of Ephesus would come and discard their unwanted babies on the top of the trash heap. The Roman law, death by exposure, permitted the citizens of the empire to throw their unwanted babies away in places like this. And in the exposure to the heat, the dehydrating infants would soon pass out of this life. And it was into the sad stench of a dump like this that Christians grabbed an opportunity. History tells us that early Christians came out here and harvested these babies, took them back into their homes, and reared them. I'm wondering if you had discarded one of your babies. Perhaps walking down the street in Ephesus, you would see a follower of Jesus with three or four little children around them. And if you would wonder if one of them was yours. Needless to say, this behavior of the early church caught the attention of the Roman Empire. It made people think these people are really different in a very compelling way. Under the cover of the Roman rule of death by exposure, Serranos of Ephesus, a world-famous gynecologist, wrote a manual for midwives. And in that manual, he described how they should measure the limbs and the bodies and the proportions of newborn babies to see if whether or not this baby was worth rearing. If the baby didn't pass the muster, then the family would bring the baby here to this dump. Perhaps the baby was deformed. Perhaps the baby was a girl, or perhaps the baby was inconvenient. Whatever the case, death by exposure gave them the permission to unload their children to the steaming sun of these hillsides. Why would anybody want to do this? It's really hard to imagine, isn't it? But given the reality that the temple to Artemis was full of hundreds of temple prostitutes, unwanted births were a daily event. So often these prostitutes would bring their babies out here and leave them to die. There was another reason, and that was because the equestrian class, the highest level of privileged citizens in Ephesus, who wore purple in the streets, who had all the best seats in the theater and at the games, in order to maintain your status in that upper level class, you had to have a certain amount of money in your portfolio. That was measured periodically. If you lost some money, you would be eliminated from the privileged part of society. Too many children would often drain your resources. So in order to maintain your place in the equestrian class, to be a person of purple, uh, you might want not to have too many children. And death by exposure permitted you to maintain your status. The 
interesting and important question is why would Christians come out here to rescue these little babies off the town dump? Well, the answer is found in the fact that, according to the book of Acts, that Christians in Ephesus were called people of the way. They were followers of Jesus, the one who came and said, I am the way, I'm the way to live. And in the life of Jesus, they had learned early on the value of children and the value of life. In a world that disdained children and pushed them away, it was Jesus who said, permit the little children to come unto me. And he also warned that if you abuse even one of these little ones, it would be better that a millstone were hung around your neck. And the value of life, he said that he himself was life and had come to give us life. So the early Christians seeing this brutal waste of infants were compelled by Jesus. They were followers of him. They would be like him in their world. And that is why they came to take these babies into their homes. And it was that difference in their lives that caught the attention of a watching world uh, that in essence became the neighborhood chatter about these Christians do these things. And it's what opened the door of people's hearts for others to hear about Jesus, who was truly the way. All right. Interesting, very sobering as well. Um, we can note a whole lot of present day correlations and that would be easy and I'm sure your thoughts went there as well. Uh, that's not really the subject matter tonight so much when I say present day correlations with modern America. Um, uh, their trash heaps um, would be equal, well, let me say it this way, our abortion on demand would be equal to their trash heaps. That's, that's where Ephesus was and our abortion on demand um, uh, the legal, uh, that you could legally discard your child and uh, if they were an inconvenience. Um, so abortion, and we're not going to spend much time on that, although that's something I could spend days on, but abortion and abandonment because of inconvenience. You know, so a lot, a lot of most abortions are, are, are based on that. It's going to be um, a, a tremendous inconvenience. I can't raise this child. Um, to them, we just heard uh, for the equestrian class, it was like this is going to cost us status. It, it may slow our life down. Uh, well, uh, it's hard for me being a, a parent and a grandparent loving our kids like I do to realize that, peop that people um, could do such a thing as that we just heard, but it's done by the millions every day. You know what? And we do not hate the, the, the young ladies that are doing this. We want to see them saved. We don't want to. It, it's uh, absolute murder. There's just no way around it. It's just absolute murder. Uh, much of it is by same way that the trash heaps of Ephesus was uh, just because it's not going to fit our lifestyle and I uh, and, and what we saw here we understand that uh, and I've even before day of discovery you can find that this is this is this is not off the wall stuff you can read this in any commentary um, that the temple of Artemis Artemis slash Diana um, they were both I have it in my notes, but that's one and the same. The Romans, I might not get this right, the Romans were, they called her the Artemis, and the Ephesians or the Greeks called her Diana. Anyway, um, a goddess, and there was a huge temple there, um, and they celebrated their goddess. Um, we'll read it right out of the book of Acts. Um, that was the main religion of the city, is to celebrate this goddess and there were temple hundreds 
hundreds. This is, Ephesus was a big place, and there were hundreds of temple prostitutes. And, of course, there's no contraceptive. So they're having these babies on a continual basis. And then, you know, it's going to interfere with their job. So they just discard the child almost as soon as it's born. Um, l- let me say this. You know this as I'm turning my notes. What we're facing in America today, um, it's not a social problem. It's a sin problem. Yeah. And uh, the Democrats can't fix it. Uh, the Republicans can't fix it. Only the power of God through hub cities like Amokali and other places where power comes and the glory of the Lord is so penetrating that it, dem- that it penetrates a city, a region, and emanates and gets over into uh, it gets it gets over into see even when people are not born again it can influence society uh, we want to see everybody that we possibly can born again and come into a miracle working revival but you've got to understand that um, it will influence revivals like what we're talking about and tonight's lesson really is about uh, hub cities or proving, we started this last week, but proving to you scripturally, and we're going to look at, as I said, we're not going to, to Revelation, but out of the book of Acts. Can a city be a hub city, or let's say it like this, a spiritual sanctuary city, where it actually uh, brings forth a sanctifying to a locale, because revival's not, revival will, will be like a general, it, it'll touch an army, and that army may be high Alabama, high Georgia, high wherever, you know, wherever, high Germany. That army may be in different places. But uh, revival is not just going to touch people that are not uh, walking in that direction. In other words, the, the groundswell, where it's coming from, the grassroots, it, this is not just going to jump on people just because it jumps on them. But where it starts and where people are calling on God for, it will begin to emanate and it'll change and it'll influence. See, see, even a revival here, we don't don't think like this. And I I didn't even put this in my notes. I'm thinking about right now. And I'll I'll say this not to be impressive. Amazing enough, you you remember a couple of years ago, Homer and I met uh, the governor of the state. We sat right in front of him. Well, this week we got to sit right in front of him. He's the senator now. And we sat right in front of him and talked to him for, you know, with everybody else for about an hour. But Senator Scott said this, and he's so right. He said something on this line. It's the universities. It's the students of the universities that, I can't remember exactly how he said it, that change things and mindsets. In, in, in society. See, a revival here in Immokalee, the blind see, the lame walk, deaf hear, the dumb speak, the doctrine of righteousness, holiness, and the pure doctrine of his word can not only affect Immokalee, it can affect Southwest Florida, it can eff- affect uh, universities where kids start getting saved and where, see, even the fight right now and I don't watch much of it. I hardly ever watch it anymore. I, I used to watch it all the time. I hardly ever watch it anymore. It's not that I've tried to garrison myself against it. I just don't hardly ever watch news anymore. But um, even the fight right now that's, that's on to just do away with our president, it's all about the scepter of righteousness concerning these same subjects of the unborn. The enemy hates that. The enemy being Satan himself. That's, that's, all, that's just the bottom line in the spiritual realm. Okay? In the spiritual realm. Um, Timothy said this. Don't, you don't have to turn there, but you can earmark it or you can write it down in your notes. Or you, you could if you... But Tim, Paul said this to Timothy concerning in the last days. He said men would be lovers of their own self in the last days. And we see that in society right now, more than ever before. Paul said this to Timothy, and he wrote it to Timothy. 
uh, and to the church at Ephesus. This goes to the church there. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, 2 Timothy 3, 1. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, such turn away. And having a form of godliness, you know, what he's talking about is the church. He's talking about all this being in the church, really. So the essence of tonight's message is the impact of the power of God uh, that it had on Ephesus. And then how can, how can we uh, see because at, bef okay. the Lord wrote through John, got it over to them and said, you're in trouble, Ephesus. You've done a lot of things right, but you're, you've matured. 30 years earlier, at least 30 years earlier, Paul established Ephesus. But we find from Acts chapter 19 that there was a strong revival taking place. 30 to 4, you know, the, I can throw these numbers out and be real kind of, you know, I, can, I got a lot of room here because we're talking centuries. But 30 to 40 years later uh, is when God or Christ warns Ephesus Paul's already gone. Paul's already dead or he's already passed away. He's been beheaded. John's still alive, but Jesus is warning Ephesus. Ephesus, you've been doing a lot of things right, but you've lost your first love. So, but for a long time, Ephesus was a hub. Ephesus was a, re, a, a revival hub, and that's what we want to look at tonight. Um, the point is, is that Ephesus was a thriving in revival for a good while in the midst of the deepest, darkest of perversion. The perver perversion of all the temple prostitutes. See, this is a huge city with tens of thousands of Christian converts, but a lot more people that were not. Um, the largest, let me just name some things that we already know. The largest church or temple in the city was built to a false god or devil. Prostitution was legal and encouraged by the elders of the city. Abortion on demand. In other words, you, you, you wouldn't be arrested as a prostitute if you're a temple prostitute. I don't know if they had a difference. Abortion on demand or death by exposure was legalized by the government. Well, we, we have similar things. Preaching the gospel. Another thing, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ could bring about extreme persecution to the point of being physically beat, imprisoned, or killed. And we see that in just a moment when I actually have you turn to some scripture. So... Um, a few more notes before we turn there. The church, oh, this is, listen to this, please, and those of you that are watching. This is a general statement, but it's true. The church has been reduced in understanding its significance in the midst of darkness. Because we think, well, I'm in this city, and this city's got a lot of stuff going on. Every city's got a lot of stuff. We know Immokalee's got a lot of junk going on. Okay, uh, there's all kinds of, I don't want to try to go into all that, but I wrote this paragraph, I, I believe this paragraph. We snivel with fear at attacking the principalities of a city with our gospel. We think so less of ourselves than the significance that God has placed upon us in the confidence of what he's made us and sent to us in the form of the very power of God by the person of the Holy Ghost. So it kind of, I'm generalizing this. I'm not personalizing it. I'm accusing you. But I'm saying w the church as a whole snivels or it shakes in its boots about trying to take a city and believing God for a revival because there's darkness out there. You know, they're out there doing evil things. First of all, the present resistance, no matter where you live in America, in comparison, well, maybe there's maybe a few inner city places that may, may not, uh, this statement may not be totally correct. But first of all, the present resistance, no matter where you live in America, in comparison to the city like Ephesus, is not even one-tenth of the level that the Ephesians faced 
and yet had a great outpouring. So again, I'm trying to get us to hone in on Pastor Bronk, you've been saying, we've been saying, Immokalee's in a revival. You know, there's other places, Tulsa's in a revival, Dayton's in a revival. They have their own confessions. Can we really do that? Well, we know, first of all, that Jerusalem was a hub city. It was a, it was a place where revival or it was the outpouring of the gospel. It was, it was the initiation. It was the fullness of the gospel. Um, Paul took that in his strength and his anointing to Ephesus, but it mushroomed from there. So that's what, that's what I want us to see more than anything else. I'm telling you what I want to tell you in that I want us to have proof positive in our confessions, in our belief. And it doesn't matter what's going on in Immokalee. It doesn't even begin to mount up to what Ephesus. First of all, and I'll just say it like this. This is real practical. Uh, first of all, there are no temples built in Immokalee strictly for pagan worship of other gods. In other words, you don't come to our town or it's not on brochures uh, that we have a huge temple built to uh, Artemis or Diana or some uh, satanic deity. I'm, glad, I'm so thankful that I lay down tonight and Immokalee is not known for um, that we don't have the biggest church, the biggest satanic church uh, in the world in Immokalee. Isn't that wonderful? Now, somebody said, well, there are satanic churches in Immokalee. I, I don't care. It doesn't, I mean, you know, maybe there's some underground stuff and people meet in their homes and they're, that's okay. I mean, it's not okay, but, but thank God that the, when you went to Ephesus, the main thing about Ephesus was there was this major, big, huge temple that stood um, to princess, you know, or not princess, but um, uh, the goddess Diana. Or Artemis, whatever, whoever, and you just watched as hundreds of hundreds of people were going in there, and of course they're having you know sexual intercourse, and they're you know it's all perversion. But thank God, first of all, we don't have a huge temple in Immokalee. We don't have those demons to face that are we're known. Where do you live, Immokalee? My God, isn't that the biggest satanic church in the world? Or uh, Yes, yeah, well, how do you make it? We're not even facing that devil, okay? Secondly, although we do have prostitutes here, on the books, it's illegal. They can be arrested. They're not supposed to be. And so they have to, they have to you know, they have to do whatever they're doing under darkness. Supposedly, they can be arrested. They're, it's on the books that it's against the law. Okay, we're not even fighting legalized prostitution. The other thing is that we're not fighting is that um, it's, it's, it's a law. There's a law in this city as well as there is in this state. It's real, you can't abandon your child. If you drove down and dropped your child off in the middle of town, a baby or anybody, any minor, you can be arrested for abandoning your child. We don't have that. Third or fourth is I can preach the gospel here tonight. Even though the Ephesians were a, become a great number, there was still extreme persecution. You could, you'll find out in the book of Acts 19 that they were, they, even in Paul's day, there was a, extreme persecution you could be arrested and you could be beaten. John actually died in Ephesus. John was, if you read on John, John, oh no, uh, Timothy. Timothy actually died in Ephesus. John actually, they, th they think, lived out his days. He actually, it was amazing. Uh, but Timothy actually died as the pastor of the church. He was drugged through the streets because history says he tried to stop a parade to the, um, to the goddess Artemis. And they just, you know, the, 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 the crowd just took him and uh, beat him down and then drug him to death through the streets. And here's the pastor of a church where there's thousands of Christians. So what I'm saying is Christianity did not eliminate persecution. It did not eliminate it. So I'm telling you folks... I appreciate all, I believe you guys will be with us all the way, but get war hardened. Get war hardened. If you are, if, if, if stuff, 
uh, upsets you right now, and you're, you know, the Lord gave me that thing, and I know it was from the Lord. It was a, a literary thing. It was called the, or it was like a, a, a poem or something, the, the War Hardened Soldier. It's really good. It's on our website someplace, but it, it's, it's really, really good. But um, having revival won't stop persecution. In fact, in some ways, it will enhance it. So we need to get ready for revival. I mean, get ready for revival and get ready for persecution in the last days. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. I don't know how many of you want to jump and run about that, but nevertheless, it's the truth. Okay, so go to um, Acts chapter 19. Let's look at it for a few moments together. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Jesus. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. Everybody there? Hallelujah. Pages are turning. Glasses are tapping. People are getting ready. Glory be to God. Yes, my missus is tapping her glass. Okay. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came unto Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Well, we taught on some of that last week. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto, him, they said unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus, and when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. I said last week, which we won't go into this week so much because that's not the subject matter. This is a real distinction here. Real distinction in helping, not fighting with, but helping your, you know, Baptist friend, your ecumenical friend that loves the Lord. But says, oh, I got the Holy Ghost. I know you got the Holy Ghost as in, yeah, he had to come in there because he, he made, the, he made the, the, the new nature. He, so he's got to be there in there in that part. But he's in, there in, he's in there in measure. So much so that, that Paul said, even though he knew that they were saved, he asked him, have you received the Holy Ghost? So much so. There's that much distinction in the mind of Christ that even though God's in there, He's in there only in measure, so much so that Paul said, well, yeah, okay, I'm glad you're saved, but have you received the Holy Ghost yet? So, and when they got the Holy Ghost, they didn't just say, wow, that's pretty, they spoke in tongues. It's the, that's the initial physical evidence, okay? So there's a difference between, what are, what are you saying, Pastor? There's a difference between being saved and getting filled, being filled. In fact, uh, the, wor the Word tells us, uh, in Acts chapter 2, I do have this in my notes, and they were all filled. They were filled. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, go wait and get baptized. John baptized your water. He says, but you shall be baptized not many days hence. Baptized means fully immersed. Okay? I know you got the Holy, I know the Holy Ghost comes in there to a measure because he, he's got to because he, he, he got to perform, he got to build, he got to Build the house, the new nature. But he's not in there in fullness because you, because you got to get filled. <laughs> How redundant is that? Okay, Acts 19, um, 7 says this. And all the men were about 12. Um, well, backing up to verse 6. Let me make it fluent. Um, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came upon them. He's talking to these guys, and then they get filled. He sp they spake with tongues. And it says in verse 7, all the men were about 12 men. And went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months. So the, here Paul is kind of starting this church in Ephesus. Disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. <clears throat> And 9, verse 9 says, But when difference or divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of Tyrannus. And so we said last week that Tyrannus 
was probably, they say, a Stoic or somebody. He might have been a Greek at one time, philosopher himself, but he had a school there. And basically, from what we get out of this, he kind of invited Paul, come over and you can teach and use my building. You can use my forum, my, my venue, okay? So that worked out well because Paul couldn't teach in the synagogue anymore. But he stayed there, and the Bible says in 10, verse 10, this continued by the space of two years so that all which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, Jews both, uh, G, uh, the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greek. Notice that the gospel was spreading out of the city of Ephesus to all of Asia. So that was kind of the headquarters for Paul. He was in, and you know, we went through that whole map. The first city was Ephesus. We went through that whole seven churches. But it says here that the word went out of Ephesus. Notice that the gospel was spreading out of the city of Ephesus to all of Asia. The seven churches of the book of Revelation that we have just studied were being affected by what was going on in the city of Ephesus. So again, here's proof for us. Um, and this will happen any place where anybody puts their roots down and says, I want to receive a revival. And start. it's taken us 20 plus years to go into the level of doctrine that we're at right now. I really praise God that we didn't get revival 10 years ago. We're, we're, with the doctrine we had, it was good. It is built significantly. It hasn't changed. It's only been magnified in line upon line, precept on precept, here a little, there a little. Let's look at verse 11. And God wrought special miracles by the hands. Of, so here comes miracles. God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. The special miracles were not special in that God could only use Paul, but they were special as in different in the way in which God delivered his power to the people. In other words, Pastor Dave used to say, special miracles. People will say, well, that was Paul. It was special. No, that's not what it's saying. It was special in that it was different. It was different in the way that God, God it says here, God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul. Um, and it goes on to explain what that was. These spiritual miracles were, it talks about cloths, handkerchiefs, those kinds of things. And these, this right here, when it talks about these special miracles and cloths and handkerchiefs, this is really compatible or comparable, I should say, um, to the um, uh, Jerusalem Peter shadow. That, those kinds, that was, that was special miracles. And it was different in the way that was taking place. Peter's shadow was, Peter would walk by people and just his shadow would heal people. Praise the Lord. Um, the cloths were the, uh, the point of contact. Verse, yeah, we read verse, let, let me read verse 12 and then I'll back up and say that, let me read verse 11 again, that's better. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs and or aprons and diseases departed from them and the evil spirits went out of them. Okay, um, so that it was special in the different way that God was doing it. Um, handkerchiefs, you know, we we do this sometimes. Um, the cloths, and this is always the truth in all this. This handkerchief is just a contact point. Okay, it's a contact point for somebody to take, believe. God will follow it and God will get involved in it. There's no virtue in fabric. No virtue of God in fabric, although God will inhabit fabric. Isn't that great? You know, the, Jesus, <laughs> he had a walking prayer cloth. Because <laughs> as soon as that lady touched it, well, actually, it says virtue flowed out of him. It flo 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 but it went right into the cloth, and it went right into her. She had an issue of blood. She was hemorrhaging, and uh, she had been for many, many years. And immediately, she felt it dry up, and she was like, I'm healed. It came right out of the cloth, came right into, you know, through him into the cloth. There's no, vir that's the same thing like uh, in oil. There's no virtue in oil of itself, although God will, you know, he, he will use it as a contact point. Um, it's like somebody who said, well, why don't we anoint people with oil? Well, he, uh, 
you, you, well, they said in James, you know, James says, let them call for the elders of the church, anointing them with oil. And oil is just like a prayer cloth. It is, can be a contact point. But if you study the Gospels, if you read the Gospels, you'll find that Jesus did not go around anointing all the people that he prayed for with oil. You'll find a couple of references where he did tell his disciples, anoint them with oil, pray for them. But you'll find most of the miracles that there's oil was nothing, had nothing to do with the miracle. And it wasn't even used in the miracle. A lot of times Jesus, and this goes back to that, those messages that we did on don't, don't pray for the sick, heal the sick. You'll never find in one of the Gospels where Jesus ever prayed for a sick person. Like, Father, I'm going to ask you to heal this person. He always gave directives. Peter's, Peter's uh, mother-in-law, he just walked in and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Okay, let's have lunch. You know, well, it says he did rebuke the fever. But, th you know, stop. Let's go have lunch. But, you know, m we should go, if you, long prayers are by people that are hoping that while they're praying, something happens. Long prayers for people, like while you're there to pray for them, that is uh, usually a sign of lack of power. Short, sweet directives like be healed, stop, come out, you're there to exercise authority. You're not there to pray. You do your praying behind this, in, in a prayer closet somewhere. When you go to heal, you go to give directives. Be healed. The, 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 the little 12-year-old of Jesus, he didn't go in there and spend. He just, arise, get up. Get up. It's always, you find that in all of his ministry. And you don't find him anointing. Anointing oil can be. Handkerchiefs can. Paul, they went from Paul, but they went out to, throughout Asia Minor because it was a hub. They went out in those seven churches. And the other thing, too, is here's the thing. Uh, hands, <laughs> hands trump claws. What? Hands trump, hands is the ace high royal straight or it's the royal flush you know that's the highest hand in other words the commission is you lay hands on them if you can't get to them send them a prayer cloth well pastor i'm going can i get a prayer cloth yeah it'll help I, we'll pray too but your your paddles are better than cloths because you you should have the you should have the mentality that when you lay these paddles on somebody it emanates from you now in certain cases you know, I've left maybe something, say, okay, I'm praying for you, but this makes you, a lot of times it just makes them feel good that while they're sleeping, they got something underneath their pillow. Okay, if that helps them. But hands, trump, everybody say hands, hands. Trump, trump, cloths. Okay, so if you can touch them, you don't need a cloth. Okay, the cloths are just because I can't get there. Okay, we're going to send one, you know, we sent one to wherever, Sweden or wherever. That was good. But hands, trump cloths, always remember this. There's never, never look, never look for formulas or novelties in delivering the power of God for the healing of the sick. Like, I need this little novelty, I need a, and, and a, a prayer cloth's not, but it can be, or oil's not. In other words, if you think, oh, man, if I had my anointing oil, you don't, Jesus just healed them all the time without oil. It, it can be a contact po point. Just to make people realize, oh, the oil of the Holy Spirit, God's, but it's, that's, about, that's about it. It's not long prayers or cloths or oils that heal the sick. It's the Holy Ghost through the power of the individual delivering the directive or the command of God. Now look at verse 12. So that from his body, we've read this, were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Notice here that the devils, uh, notice here that de the devils and deliverance began to mark and to earmark uh, that the deliverance and freedom from devils began to earmark uh, what was going on as, as the emphasis throughout 
first starting in Ephesus and then going out through, through Asia. Verse 13 says, Then certain of the vagabond, everybody still with me right there? Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, they were going to, you know, pray over them, uh, saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom God preacheth. Now, King James is kind of King Jamesy, <laughs> uh, vagabond Jews. That basically, what that's telling you is this. They were traveling um, deliverance ministries. That way they weren't ministries. They did it. Uh, you look at the history on it. In fact, I've got one thing here that I liked. Um, but they did it as a profession. And they weren't, they weren't saved, but they did it as a profession. Uh, if we had time, I wish we had time. Um, I wanted to read this to you, but I got a prophecy we got to listen to. And that's going to take a little bit. I'll just bring this to your, I'll bring this to your attention. May have to go. The, <laughs> there's so much word. I love the word. <laughs> but, you know, when Philip went down to Samaria, uh, Simon, the sorcerer, he was basically one of these. Um, you could consider him. Oh, I'll just read this part. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. This is Acts 8, 5. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out, and many of were, that were possessed with them, um, and many taken with palsies, that were lame were healed and there was great joy in the city but there was a certain man called Simon which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that he himself uh, was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying this man is the great power this man is the great power of God and to him they had regard because that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorcery uh, verse 17 says, then, now Peter came down. Okay, Peter comes down after this. Then laid they hands on them, the people of Samaria, and they received the Holy Ghost. Verse 18, then Simon saw that through laying on of hands of the apostles, or the apostles' hands that the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, give me also this power that on whosoever I lay my hands, they may receive the Holy Ghost. Then Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money, thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right with in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thy own heart may be forgiven. For I perceive that thou art in the, art, thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered, boy, there was such a rebuke with the, with the power of anointing that Simon, he, he, was, he didn't know what was going to happen to him. Then answered Simon and said, pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. But I read that to say these vagabond Jews, we're back to 19, Acts 19, that these certain traveling Jews were exorcists. And... Uh, I read, I, I, I copied this. I think this is important. Just a few paragraphs, oh, a couple paragraphs. This is Eliot's commentary for English readers, okay? Certain vagabond Jews, exorcists, if, if you've ever read this and said, you just skip over this. So I want you to know what these guys were. The men belong to a lower section of the class in which we have already been uh, seen representatives in Simon of Samaria, uh, Elamus, we won't go there. That's another thing that Paul ran into, another sorcerer over in Acts 13. They practice exorcism as a profession. In other words, they got money for casting out devils. And they went from city to city pretending with charms and spells to cure those who were looked on as possessed with demons. Many of these were said to have come down from Solomon, uh, teachings, I guess, and Layard's, Nineveh, the, he gives a publication, Nineveh and Babylon, there is an interesting account of several bronze bowls containing such formulas. To them, the name of the Lord Jesus, which was so often in St. Paul's lips, was just another formula mightier than the name of the Most High or the Archangel Raphael or Michael and which others used. Okay, so we read that about 
what happened to, you know, the same thing that was going on in, uh, in Samaria as well. But let me, let me go back, make sure I get my notes here. Okay, so we read that. We're going to keep on. Are you still there in Acts chapter 19? If you are, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. And we're in what, 14? 13? 13? Okay. Well, I got to go back. Because I'm 12, 13. Okay. Then certain of vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons. Now this is also, you know, kind of besides. There were seven sons of Sceva. A Jewish, a Jew, and a priest, a chief of the priest, which did so. So he's, these guys, you know, they're, they're put-ons, but they have a, a prominence in that their father is, a, has a chief plea, a priest position there in Ephesus. And so they, they, they uh, were going to call the name of Jesus over this person. And they did it, of obviously, for profit. They were, you know, money. Somebody was paying them to do so. And it says in verse 15 that the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And, when the, man, and the man in whom the evil spirit was, was leaped on them, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house Naked and wounded. In other words, he beat them down. It, was a little, it doesn't matter how big you are if you're totally demon-possessed. Uh, if you don't have the power of God, one demon-possessed 100-pound uh, woman can just whip a whole church load of pre, uh, people. Men, grown men. She can just uh, one person can whip 10 men because... They have super superhuman strength. They're, it's like the madman of Gadara. They can break chains. They can do all kinds of stuff. Um, so these guys, these guys, we uh, we we're casting you out by the the name of the one that Paul presents. The one the one that Paul presents. And I and I put this in my notes. This is much of where the body of Christ is at today. I don't have Facebook, but I, I hear about it. They are quoting buzz feeds and words from other people and acting as if they are walking in that power. In other words, uh, they're just mockingbirds. I mean, they may mock, I mean, not mock me, but they may, just cause you can quote, well, I heard this great radio preacher, I heard this, that, if they don't, but they don't have any power in their life. They don't have anything or this this, this teacher, this person on television. There will come a separation in the last days of Joel's army that will separate them and separate themselves in the, in the demonstration from the world and from the plastic church. See, that's what we're headed towards. A great separation. Uh, not only that the world is going to look on us and say, see, these guys tried to cast this thing out and the devil said, I don't even know you. You're going through a form. I don't even know you. And he jumped on them and just beat them down to where he pulled all their clothes off. And these, these seven guys are running down the street naked and just beat all to pieces. Bloody, mouth busted, ears busted, nose busted. And, uh, but <laughs> Paul had been doing all this all the time. And the church had been experiencing this. And the word of God had been going out through Asia Minor to the point that a great fame was touching all of Asia through, through Paul's ministry. Now, let's, uh, I've got more of this. We'll go right back to it next week because we really, it's raining, we really need to know that we as an Ephesus church, we say well, Ephesus lost their first love. I'm talking about an Ephesus church that Paul established and left and we'll continue to look at Acts chapter 19 more next week. But let's go ahead and pass out that prophecy. We're going to listen to it. We're going to read it. This is a prophecy that came Sunday. And uh, I really did not know how close. Let me grab one of those two, um, Robert. Can you help him? Um, Ralph or Paul? Okay. 
You get these out quicker. Um, I didn't know how quick, I mean, how quick, how close this prophecy was to what I was teaching tonight until I began to read this prophecy today. Now, it's quite long, but I'm not going to teach it. I'm, we're just going to listen to it. Marty's going to have it ready. And this will be the last thing that we do tonight um, on this. And those of you that are watching, this is on our website. You can go to Prophecies, and there's a PDF there. We're going to go it Next week, we'll get into the persecution and all that stuff that took place. Hallelujah. But please, you know, we'll be a few minutes past nine, but you're here for revival. Listen to this, and like I said, I'll get started in just a moment, and that way you can just listen to it. But please follow along because um, these are words specifically given to us as a body and to you that are watching concerning where we're headed and what God wants to do uh, in our lives concerning revival. Okay, Marty, thanks. But no, I'll take over. I'll take over in the days ahead. I'm already taking over through instruction and through presence. And when I say I'll take over, it's not that I'm not already in charge. But that which you solicit from me as in miracles and moving of my spirit and that which will catch up many into a place of intercession, those seasons will come upon you. They will last and they'll fuel. They'll be the fuel by which you'll go further. And then those seasons will lift and great works will be moved out of those seasons and wrought out of those seasons. Then I'll come again. The heart of the intercessor will always be maintained in that place. But I'll come in my services like this and greater ones as I will as in taking over the, the entirety of being able to just saturate people with my presence so strong that no one will move hardly or be able to exit the building. And from that, great glory will come to the city. From that, there'll be a magnet magnetizing to this place, not to glorify man, but they'll follow it all the way back to its origin. They'll find where is this coming from? Where is the talk of life? Those things that are happening and spreading in the city. Where are they coming from? Where is the epicenter? Where is the core? They'll follow it back to this place. Many like and such services will I give unto you. And greater beyond. Stay in intercession those of you that are because you are helping bring about these things your authority I'm borrowing not just today but I've been borrowing it for quite some time to transition and to cause this river to go the way that I want it to go saith the spirit of grace so keep pouring yourself over to me as a living sacrifice you're not only just changing yourself you're changing and bringing forth the destiny of this church and the house and the vision of revival and together like tributaries joining one stream until it produces a great river houses like this one other places and other intercessors that are your fellow brothers and sisters are interceding for this to come about and while they're interceding, they're also giving their life over to the purging process and allowing me to come in and get them ready for this last great final day harvest, saith the Spirit of grace. I cannot get over to you presently to your mind because of what you have not yet seen before in the past. I cannot get over to you the inevitability of how deep your rejoicing will be in days ahead saith the Spirit of grace. You'll find that the joy that will fuel your inner being because of the things that will be happening and the people that will be being saved 
will be as if it were an energy to you within your mortal body. You'll find that the task to sleep will be of something that will be somewhat of a task. Not because of restlessness or fear that keep many of you awake, present tense. But it will be an excitement like a child has the excitement before a celebration. Before Christmas, before their joys of the toys. But your toys, your excitement will be men's lives being changed. You'll find that the further you go, and especially you intercessors, that there will be a great joy in sacrificing your time, your energy, and your life, knowing that the dividends that will be paid will be paid. And I will not relent, saith the Lord. I will not hold back the dividends of souls, healings and miracles and the transformation process that brings forth the fullness of the exact replica of my kingdom back in the earth saith the spirit of grace Matthew Mark Luke and John will return the works and the essence the body at large will be shocked to hear and to see what they will hear and see from this place I put you on aware but do not be afraid that many will rush in in the days ahead or when they see the explosion of my glory. They'll try to merchandise it. They'll try to catch it up in ways in which Simon the sorcerer said, give me this. I'll pay money for it. But as he was rebuked, so will they be also rebuked. I'm expecting you as a caucus of elders learning line on line, precept on precept, the word of God and doctrine, that you'll be able to turn away the gainsayers in love, but if all necessary, with a stern and solemn rebuke, that those who rush in and will try to create for themselves gatherings, attention to themselves in the midst of the revival you will be a firewall in the spirit against what has debilitated and brought down and destroyed many such revivals but you are right and I declare unto you by the spirit that you are right in your understanding that the last great harvest of souls will be that which is brought up all the way to my return saith the spirit of grace and what I am preparing you for is not something that comes and then something that goes but I am preparing you and those who are part of this and watching and those that will hear in days ahead that you will be part of something that is as strong as case hardened steel it cannot and will not be broken by the times it will not be broken by persecution it is a rock it is a rock that cannot be broken that cannot be split it is the foundation of the sayings of my son and as the apostles wrote upon these things and prepared the church I saw and prophesied to you through many places that there would be an end time church that would welcome me back. There will be many growing pains in which you will grow. And there will be many times that you will have to prefer your brother. But there will be nothing that will split you. There will be nothing that diverts you because of the foundation that you have, saith the Spirit of grace. Do not fear regarding history history is a teacher it is not a dictator it does not dictate your future no church that you've ever seen that came and went is a replica to you no movement no past tense revival the revival that I began on the day of Pentecost was meant to be alive and well today and yet because 
time and man's doctrine destroyed the foundation through religion, I was forced to go underground through many centuries. But I've come back as I've always been here, but I've come back to bring forth this last and great church, saith the Spirit of Grace. So come apart, listen, listen, listen to your instructors, listen to the Word of God, prove all things, prove all things by my Word. The time is short. The harvest will be great. Your joy will be beyond words, saith the Spirit of grace. Hallelujah. Very powerful. Very, very powerful. Let's all stand together. We love everybody that's been here watching with us. We appreciate everything. We'll be right back on the subject next week. We've got more to come. I couldn't share everything tonight. I saw that, so we want to make it convenient for you. Sunday will be a very powerful service. Very, very powerful um, bring people for prayer. Bring people that need prayer. Um, I'm expecting the Holy Spirit to do mighty miracles all the time. Amen. We bless you. In the precious name of Jesus, be blessed. Amen. God bless everybody that's watched tonight. Amen.